Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Righteous there forever. Care of them as with the most high. I've had some good days. I've had some hills to climb. Man, I don't even, I'm literally at a loss for words. Um, this has been a long month and a half since the day he got in the hospital, you know. Um, you know, we talk a lot about God in our lives because if it wasn't for God being in my life, I'd be in prison. I just would. You took my child. You took him. I'm glad to see all these people here. My brother was loved by a whole bunch of people. Um, I didn't get a chance to be down here the day he closed his eyes. And that kind of hurt me a little bit. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm hurt, so hurt right now. Because me and my bro, I love my bro more than anybody can ever imagine. Me and my brother didn't hang out a lot, but he was my bro, and I miss him already. What is true with our system is that, in my belief, and I believe a lot of other people, is that when a crime is committed or a murder is committed with the police, and their standing is nobody gets to talk to the cops at all until they go through grand jury. Well, there's a reason for that. Because the DA gonna get their story together, they're gonna tell it the way they wanna tell it, okay? And they're gonna present it the way they want to. We don't get to do nothing. This is the big blockade, and the city will protect these officers at all costs. They, they've already proved that the system doesn't work. And you have a pattern of practice of doing the same things over and over and over again. Hi, I'm Joanne Hardesty and welcome back to The Truth Report. It's my pleasure to have here with me Dan Handelman, who is with Portland Comp Watch. Uh, this program has been about the legacy that Fred Bryant leaves in the Portland area. Um, and I know that you've spent some quality time with Fred over the last few years. Can you share with me when you met Fred Bryant? Yeah, well, we, there, uh, you and I both work with the Albina Ministerial Alliance Coalition for Justice and Police Reform. And there was a community forum that we had done. Uh, very shortly after Keaton Otis was killed and Fred was in the audience and he stood up and told everybody about how upset he was about what had happened mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was the first time that I met him and uh, then sometime shortly after that we were having conversations about other families that Portland Cop Watch has helped through the years who've had police shoot one of their family members and we talked a little bit about uh, so a couple of families that did these regular vigils on a, on a regular basis to remember their loved ones and I think that was partly what ended up becoming the uh, monthly vigil that he uh, was holding right up until he, uh, until he passed. Right. And I think what's surprising about that is I'm, uh, it's the first monthly vigil I've known about. I've known people do anniversary events, but I think in my time in Portland, it's the first monthly vigil mm -hmm. that I'm familiar with. There was one, uh, the family of Dickie Dow, who oh, was a right. guy who had uh, the foul mental disabilities and mm -hmm. was beaten down and, and killed by the police. Uh, they held monthly vigils. Um, it was always like on the second Friday of every month. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, so what Fred has done and is, uh, you know, is still going on, it's my understanding, um, is that on the 12th of every month, uh, we remember Keith Notice because that was the day he was killed on the 12th of May in 2010. So, right. um, but yeah, and then before that, way back when we first started Portland Cop Watch in 90, 92 or 93, um, there was, uh, 
Tony Shaw was a, a suspect in a stolen car incident. The police boxed him in in traffic and shot him. Um, he was there was a teenage girl in the seat next to him, and his family was held. I can't remember how frequently, but I think it was monthly vigils as well down on Southeast Stark Street. So okay, so there was some some history some of previous that. Previous history of that. Wonderful. Um, and I know that uh, Portland Comp Watch. Uh, so what resources do you provide to family members who have been killed by police violence? Well, uh, resources is kind of a vague word, um, but uh, <laughs> we, we provide advice to anybody who's had an incident with the Portland police that, that they think is misconduct, uh, that we can point them in the direction of how, how, what would you do to try to remedy this, uh, the harm that's been done to you. So uh, in some cases where basically the, what the cop did was very minor, like called somebody a name, um, there's no, you can't really file a lawsuit about that. There's no, no real loss you can show, uh, but you can file a complaint about it. So we'll point them in the direction of the place where to file a complaint. Um, but if you have a, a serious injury or if you've been locked up wrongfully or some other kind of real serious civil rights problem like a shooting death, um, then you can file with an attorney. And so we'll offer them a list of attorneys who take these cases and uh, you know we, we only do that when there's a lot of evidence um, uh, that something some side of civil rights violations has taken a ca uh, taken place because the, otherwise the lawyers who are on the list they don't want to get a call oh yeah the officer called me a so-and-so right mm -hmm. and, you know, so, so it has to rise to a certain level before we'll um, send that list out but you know well that's something that we'll do for families um, and the, you know we our, our mission at Portland Cop Watch is to empower people to uh, redress the grievances basically a, about what happened mm. so we don't like get out in front of them I mean we we do write about basically every shooting that happens and we find every shooting to be outrageous because our, it's our government that is using its power right. and authority to take a, a life away and that's not something we want our government doing as an organization we're part of a peace group um, but um, if the family's willing to step up um, you know we'll help them uh, organize things like the, the vigils were something that Fred decided that he wanted to do. So we, you know, we put the word out to our constituents. We try to bring picket signs when we can. Uh, you know, we try to write things about what's going on with their case. Uh, in Fred's particular case, uh, he tried to uh, he tried to do something that had never been tried before. That um, our oversight system, which, as you know, is not what all it could be. Uh, has the ability, if you file a complaint and they investigate your complaint and they say, oh, there was no misconduct, you can appeal that finding to a nine-member citizen body, the Citizen Review Committee. And we had one client, so-called, so uh, who had been shot and survived, mm -hmm. and he tried to file an appeal uh, to that body, and um, n he never heard back from them, basically. Uh, so Fred tried to file an appeal about Keaton's death. Um, to the Citizen Review Committee, and he's, he had a lawyer prepare, a lawyer from the National Lawyers Guild, prepared a document saying, this is why I think he has the right to file an appeal. And it took them six months, and they finally wrote back some convoluted explanation of why they think that the city ordinance doesn't. And in fact, they had asked the police chief, and the police chief agreed with them that they shouldn't investigate this yeah. particular case. Uh, I remember that. It, it, it's a, it was a very strange, um, you know, it, there, when you talk about shootings and deaths with the city, it's like the third rail. They don't want to even go there. Uh, and I think that's part of what, you know, what the frustration for Fred throughout his entire time fighting for justice was he would try to bring things up to them, yeah. and they would just, you know, they wouldn't even want to talk to him. Well, and I, so I, I guess that's the question. So Fred's legacy is one of trying to fight systems that really don't want to be held accountable, right? Um, and uh, I spoke earlier about the committee, uh, a group of volunteers who are continuing the uh, Justice for Keep Notice effort. I uh, invited people to go to the Facebook page and get involved, come out on the next 12th, uh, which will be January 12th. Uh, uh, to the vigil, uh, but um, what advice would you give to other families like at the beginning? Because I think Fred was different, right? Most most families, it takes them a while to actually get out 
and start advocating for justice for their for their family member, mm -hmm. right? And I think Fred was a bit different because almost immediately he wanted to do something, mm -hmm. right? And he took every legal avenue he had to try to seek justice for his son, mm -hmm. and which exacerbated his health issues, and mm -hmm. that's why he's not with us anymore. But what advice would you give to a family member who, hmm. uh, someone who uh, their family member was injured or killed by Portland police, what would be the Mm. first couple of things you would tell them mm. that they sh would do? Well, I mean, I think always when that happens, the first thing that they need space to do is to grieve right. because they've lost somebody that's very close to them. And they shouldn't make any rash decisions uh, right off the top that you know they might regret later. Uh, and then they should think about how, how they want to go about dealing with it, um, whether they want to go through the courts, whether they want to go through the media, whether they want to go through both. There are a lot of attorneys who don't appreciate if you go out in the public and start saying stuff about a case because you could get facts out there that are wrong mm -hmm. and that makes things more confusing down the line when, if you end up in a court. Um, I personally think that we got to do both. I think you got to go the legal route and you got to be out in the streets. And if you weren't a witness, if the, if the family members weren't an actual witness, mm -hmm. then it's, it's less of a yeah, issue. issue. But, you know, so there's a, lot, a whole bunch of things to sort, of, sort out. And of course, you know, like with, with Keaton, you know, uh, from what Fred describes, having seen his, his son's dead body um, in the morgue, uh, it just seems like you have a lot to process, you know, just seeing what the, what the police do to you. I mean, you know, Keaton, you know, again, when you're saying it's an unusual case, uh, he was hit with what was like 24 of 32 bullets, That's right? That's right. So, um, you know, you gotta, you gotta find a way to process it and, and be prepared for the long haul, right. right? That's the other thing, that no matter what it is, whether it's a police shooting or anything, the, our legal system, takes a long time to deal with these things. Sad but true. I'm Joanne Hardesty. I've been talking to Dan Handelman with Portland Cop Watch. Uh, their, your website is? Uh, www.portlandcopwatch.org. Thank you. You have been watching the Truth Report. Hi, this is Joanne Hardesty with the Truth Report. I want to let you know that uh, the 12th of each month, the uh, vigil for Keaton Otis is held at the corner of Northeast 6th Avenue in Halsey. And you're invited to come, seek justice for Keaton Otis, and seek justice for Fred Bryant. In addition, if you'd like more information on the Justice for Keaton Otis campaign, feel free to go to Facebook and look for Justice for Keaton Otis and become a member and you'll get updates on additional activity, including a community grand jury that will take place in the summer of 2014. Again, this is The Truth Report and I'm Joanne Hardesty. There were people put in my life that I had never met in my life. I have a team of people that I would have been lost because everywhere I went, every lawyer, everything, everybody shut the door because they said he had a gun and he didn't have a gun. You know? um, but I have a support team of people that um, when I started doing the vigils, you know, um, they just came out of nowhere. Very bright people. People that can peel the onion and get down to the seed. And that's what they have done. I just tried to stay calm. You know, um, I'm a survivor of, of a congestive heart failure and I wear a pacemaker. My volunteer work is very stressful. And I use that so I didn't have to think about what was going on. But then, you know, um, I became a workaholic, a volunteer holic, right? Um, and, uh, but it was these people that when we started these vigils and got his web page up and did all this stuff, I keep telling, I, I don't know what, I, I would be lost. I would be lost because I, I, I don't know how to do that stuff they do. I don't know how to research stuff. I mean, I'm like, hands-on guy, okay, I see that, okay, I can figure that out. 
you show me a video and I'm looking at it, I can figure that out. You know, I've been to City Hall and I've said to them blatantly, these videos don't match. And they don't. I'm glad that he made an impact on so many people's lives. And he was a great man. And he still is a great man.